Welcome to Fuqua's LinkedIn Live series. I'm Kim Wade Benzoni, and I'm on the faculty in the management and organizations area. It's great to be here today and to have this opportunity to share my work with you. Today, I'm going to be talking about a line of work that explores the psychology of intergenerational decisions. I'm going to begin with a story of a wealthy and successful man who, one day in the year of 1888, following his brother's death, was reading what was supposed to be his brother's obituary in a French newspaper. But as he read, he realized that the newspaper editor had mistakenly confused the two brothers and had written the obituary for him instead. The headline proclaimed, the merchant of death is dead, and then described a man who had gained his wealth by helping people to kill one another. Not surprisingly, he was deeply troubled by this glimpse of what his legacy might have been had he actually died on that day. And it's believed that this incident was pivotal in motivating him to leave nearly his entire fortune following his actual death a few years later to fund awards each year to give to those whose work most benefited humanity. This is, of course, the true story of Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite and the founder of the Nobel Prize. I tell this story to highlight a central motivator of intergenerational beneficence and one that I'll be talking about today. Acting on the behalf of future generations represents an opportunity to extend oneself into the future to create a positive and lasting impact. One of the most important aspects of intergenerational relations is that the interests of present and future generations are not always aligned. For example, maintaining sustainable levels of beneficial resources for future generations can require that the present generation give up some of those benefits for themselves. And similarly, protecting future generations from costly burdens may require that the present generation incur some of the costs of managing those burdens themselves. In my research, I consider situations in which people are faced with a trade-off between self-interest in the present and the interests of others in the future. The focus is to understand the central barriers to intergenerational beneficence, and then to identify the factors that lead people to act on the behalf of future generations even when there is no material or economic incentive for them to do so. Critically, intergenerational contexts are characterized by the intersection of intertemporal and interpersonal dimensions. They affect the future and they affect other people. We know that it's difficult for people to defer the consumption of benefits in the present and save them for the future. There's a very large and well-established body of research on intertemporal choice showing that people tend to discount the value of resources that are consumed in the future. And there is a strong preference for consumption in the present. And we also know that it's difficult for people to give up beneficial resources so that other people can have them. So if we put these two forces together in the intergenerational context, we might expect a compounded force working in opposition to intergenerational beneficence. And we might expect the prospects for future generations to be quite grim. In fact, when I first started doing research on this, people would frequently ask me, why would anyone ever act on the behalf of future generations when there's nothing in it for them? And that is the question that this research seeks to answer. I can share with you that in literally dozens of experiments in which there is no material or economic incentive to give anything to future generations, nearly everyone leaves something for future generations. And in fact, there are surprising levels of intergenerational beneficence in light of the inherent barriers. Why is that? What is going on that is counterbalancing the significant forces that work in opposition to intergenerational beneficence? The answer 
is that the combination of intertemporal and interpersonal components create conditions of special significance that make it possible for people to get something that they really want and need. And that's very motivating under certain circumstances. What people can get by acting on the behalf of future generations is legacy. You don't get legacy by having a fleeting temporary effect. And you don't get legacy by affecting only your own future self. You need both these elements, time and others, in combination to create the conditions that make it possible for you to leave a legacy. And legacy motivations are rooted in the desire to feel that one's life has meaning. And the legacy itself functions as a carrier of that meaning, extending the self into the future through impacts on other people in the future. So it makes sense that when legacy motivations are enacted, people are going to be more likely to exhibit behaviors that benefit future generations. Given that legacy motivations are so important in intergenerational decisions, a central agenda for my co-authors and I has been to identify the factors that induce legacy motivations. We've looked at many variables, but today I'm going to talk about just a few of them. First, the behavior of prior generations makes a difference. We often inherit the consequences of decisions of prior generations. And while we don't always have the opportunity to reciprocate the behavior of prior generations directly back to them, they can reciprocate in a more generalized way by behaving similarly to the next generation. When we know we have benefited from the legacy of the prior generation, that gets us thinking about the positive legacy we want to leave for future generations. And that in turn leads to behaviors that are beneficial to future generations. This is a very robust effect that has been replicated many times across multiple studies. But my co-authors and I wanted to take a closer look at this phenomenon to try to better understand some of its nuances. In particular, we wanted to know what happens if the outcomes to subsequent generations don't match the intentions of prior generations? For example, what if the intentions of prior generations were good, but the outcomes were bad for reasons beyond the prior generation's control? Under such circumstances, is the present generation influenced by the prior generation's good intentions or by the bad outcomes they inherit? Along with co-authors Min Bang and Christy Zhao, in multiple studies, we found that people make their decisions based on the perceived intentions of previous generations, rather than the actual outcomes inherited. As long as they have information about those intentions. When information about intentions is not available, that's when people infer intentions from outcomes. And that can be problematic when intentions and outcomes are decoupled. Because intergenerational reciprocity is a double-edged sword. When we perceive the behavior of prior generations as helpful, we respond by helping the next generation. But if we view the prior generation as selfish, then it can have a negative effect on intergenerational beneficence. So an important practical question becomes, how can we break a cycle of negative intergenerational reciprocity? How can we prevent selfish behavior from being reciprocated forward? For our next experiment, we developed an intervention designed to induce legacy motivations with the idea that it might help to nullify negative intergenerational reciprocity. We asked half the participants in our study to write a brief essay about how they would like to have an impact on future generations, how they would like to be remembered, and how they would like the world to be different as a result of their life. For the other half of the participants, the writing task was omitted, and that was our control condition. All the participants inherited an outcome from prior generations. Some were positive and some were negative. 
And we found that when we induce legacy motivations, it did indeed break that cycle of negative intergenerational reciprocity. Another variable we have looked at is power. This work is in collaboration with Lee Toast and Hannah Johnson. Leaving a great legacy is arguably the most powerful thing you can do in your career in life because it enables you to have influence well into the future, even after you are out of the picture yourself. Most research on power suggests that the experience of power tends to make people more self-focused and self-interested. However, this research primarily considers the effect of power in limited time frames. Our research on intergenerational decisions involved longer time frames and revealed that power can lead decision makers to be more concerned with the interests of others in the future. Across multiple experiments, we found that when people are thinking about power or feeling more powerful, they are actually more generous to future generations because they're more focused on their legacy and they feel more social responsibility as compared to when their power is not prominent. Finally, one of the most effective means of prompting legacy motivations to emerge is through death priming. By death priming, I mean we remind people about death. When we're reminded about death, we remember that we don't want to die. We want to live. But we understand that death is inevitable. And that fact can create, create an existential dilemma in light of our deeply rooted survival instinct. One of the most effective things we can do to buffer our anxiety about death is to attempt to transcend death by finding meaning in our lives. Central to this meaning is that we have impact that persists beyond our physical existence. People feel better in the face of death if they're part of something that will live on after them. Having a positive impact on future generations can help fulfill that need. In collaboration with co-authors Lee Toast, Morella Hernandez, and Rick Larrick, we found that when people are primed with death, they're more generous in resource allocations to future generations. And the way we manipulated death awareness was by having participants read different newspaper articles, which in some cases involved the death of a person, such as an article about a plane crash, and in some cases had no mention of death, such as an article about a mathematician solving a puzzle. In the control conditions, we found what you would expect based on what we know about intertemporal choice. People value the resource more if it is consumed in the present as compared to the future. And so they allocated more resources to present others. But when death was primed, we see a striking reversal of this effect, where people allocate more to others who will benefit in the future as compared to the present. To summarize, legacy motivations are a central force in promoting behaviors that benefit future generations. The desire to leave a legacy is one of the most powerful of human motivators because it addresses the fundamental need for life meaning by providing an avenue for self-extension into the future beyond the constraints of mortal life. Let me pause there and answer a few questions. The first question is, if your studies show that nearly everyone leaves something for future generations, why do we see such evidence of short-termism in our society today? Thanks for the question. Let me clarify. In my research, intergenerational beneficence is greater than zero. People leave something for future generations, but that doesn't mean it's enough to address the challenges in our society today. We can see behaviors around us in everyday life of people striving to help reduce our impact on future generations, such as recycling efforts. But it's not enough. My research focuses on how to increase intergenerationally beneficent behavior from the current state to greater levels. 
many of our behaviors and everyday decisions affect future generations. But that doesn't mean that we always recognize them for what they are. We don't always think of them as intergenerational trade-offs. And that's part of the problem. In my experiments, intergenerational decisions are explicitly framed as intergenerational decisions. It's clear that there's a trade-off at stake. So one of the challenges is to figure out how to elucidate the relationship between what we're doing in the present and our impact on future generations. In my experiments, the level of intergenerational beneficence is higher when legacy motivations are induced. But when they're not, such as in the control conditions, the levels are significantly lower. So the idea is to get people thinking about their legacy, which is an innovation and an insight that we can transform into an intervention, such as what we did in the experiment I described earlier, involving the legacy writing task. Once we get people thinking about their legacy, it solves the first problem of getting them to think about their decisions in intergenerational terms because your legacy, by definition, involves your impact on future generations. The next question is, can you talk about different types of legacies and how that plays into your research? That's a great question because legacies come in different forms and we still need to figure out what is going to determine the type of legacy we want to leave. In research collaboration with Matt Fox, we found that one good way to categorize legacies is to think about who is going to benefit from the legacy. And that falls into three categories. First, individualistic legacies are focused on the benefits to oneself, such as building monuments named after oneself. Relational legacies benefit others with whom you share a direct relationship, such as giving your children an inheritance. And finally, collective legacies benefit larger collectives, such as charities, universities, or society at large. One variable that we have found <clears throat> to affect legacy type is death awareness. When we looked more closely at this variable, we found that death awareness can be experienced quite differently in either an anxious or reflective state, which we call death anxiety versus death reflection. In the anxious state, people are very emotional and apprehensive and focused on self-protection. In contrast, people can experience death awareness in a more reflective state, which is more cognitive and analytical. In recent and ongoing research with co-author Matt Fox, we have found that both forms of death awareness can lead to legacy motivations and behaviors that benefit future generations. But the form of death awareness affects the nature of the legacy. Specifically, Death anxiety leads to a focus on a legacy that benefits a more narrowly defined in-group, where in contrast, death reflection leads to a focus on a legacy that benefits larger, more inclusive groups. For example, if you're an alumnus and thinking about donating money to the university, under conditions of death reflection, you might give money to Duke University as a whole. Whereas if you were experiencing death anxiety, you would focus on a narrower in-group such as just Fuqua. Let me take another question. The question is, how can the insights from your research be used to improve societal and organizational outcomes? That is a great question because our research and ongoing work is very focused on how we can apply our research findings to various contexts. To illustrate, let me talk about another set of studies that I've been working on in collaboration with Jessica Paik and Daniela Goya Ticetto. In this research, we look at how thinking about your legacy can affect intergenerational wealth allocations, a context that we think is very important at both the individual and societal levels. 
in these studies, we used the legacy induction task I described earlier in my discussion of intergenerational reciprocity. Once again, we asked people to think about the ways in which they would like to have an impact on other people in the future, how they would like to be remembered, and how they would like the world to be different as a result of them having lived. It's a couple of paragraphs and takes about five minutes. And of course, we also had a control group where this task was omitted. We then asked people to allocate a sum of money among various categories of future generation beneficiaries. And they're given some options that reflect the three different categories of beneficiaries, individual, relational, and collective. For example, in the individual category, they could allocate money for a new building named after themselves or a patent on their behalf. In the relational category, they could allocate money to their children and grandchildren. And finally, in the collective category, they could give it to cancer research and need-based scholarships for education. And what we found was that the legacy prime led to significant reductions in the amount allocated to relational categories, like one's own children, and a significant increase in that allocated to collectivistic categories, like charities. And we replicated this effect across multiple studies. We call this shift in allocations from relational to collective categories, the Andrew Carnegie effect, and I will explain why. Andrew Carnegie was the founder of Carnegie Steel Company, and one of the richest Americans in history. He was known, he was, but he was also known for his philanthropy, giving away 90% of his fortune, about 65 billion in today's dollars, to charities, foundations, and universities. He believed strongly that the rich should use their wealth to improve society, and that it was a terrible idea for the rich to leave their money to their children. Addressing intergenerational challenges such as global climate change, will entail motivating people to extend their goodwill beyond the borders of close relationships and directing it to collective causes. And our legacy prime is an effective intervention that can nudge people in this direction. As another example of an applied context, we have looked at how legacy motivations affect employees' well being. Organizational life is fertile ground for creating and transmitting a legacy. The organization can function as a beneficiary of an individual's legacy or as the legacy itself in cases in which new organizations are created. In collaboration with Daniela Goya Ticetto, we found across multiple studies that legacy motivations are significantly related to job satisfaction. Specifically, greater legacy motivations lead to greater job satisfaction. And this is the case because feeling like you have created a, a legacy increases life and work meaning. So helping people to recognize the organizational context as an opportunity to leave a legacy and thus make work more meaningful and satisfying opens an avenue for potentially improving employee well-being productivity, and motivation. The next question is, do people with more children exhibit more intergenerational beneficence? I get asked that question a lot. And I always collect information on demographics in my studies, including whether or not participants have children and how many. In my research, I have not found a consistent relationship between number of children or whether or not someone has children and how much they will sacrifice for future generations. But that doesn't mean there isn't a relationship. And I have a hypothesis based on my observations of the behavior of people around me. What I think happens is that having children makes people more the way they were before they had children. So if they were less likely to engage in intergenerationally sustainable behaviors before having children, then having children gives them a reason to continue along that path because they're so focused on taking care of their own children. In contrast, those who were high on intergenerationally sustainable behaviors before um, 
children become more so after having children because now they're worried about how about the world that their own children will inherit. So this is a nuanced relationship that requires longitudinal data collected before and after having children. And that nuance isn't going to be revealed by looking at the data I have in hand, which just looks at the correlation between children and behaviors at a single point in time. So that's how I think it works. But once again, to be clear, that is a hypothesis and not something shown by the data that has been collected to date. We're almost out of time. So I wanted to end with some concluding comments. In recent months, we've had a lot of urgent issues to deal with, especially public health and social injustice but we don't wanna lose sight of the fact that we're still in the middle of a global environmental crisis. That's still happening on top of all the other challenges facing us right now. Environmental scientists say that if we continue on our current trajectory, the natural disasters that we will experience such as wildfires and hurricanes in 10 to 20 years will be so severe and horrifying that we will look back on 2020 and say, those were the good old days. We don't have the option of choosing among the challenges of our time. We need to find integrative approaches that deal with our many societal challenges simultaneously. And taking the intergenerational perspective really helps elucidate how all these issues are interconnected. Global climate change is intertwined with public health and safety. And inequalities in society will be intensified as climate change escalates. We have a lot to do. The good news is that humans are incredibly innovative and resourceful and have a strong survival instinct. So hopefully we can put our heads together and figure out how to survive and thrive into the future. Thank you for joining the session today, and I hope you will join us next week when Professor Robert Swinney will be talking about the role of supply chains during COVID-19. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>